Hi, Matt. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm very good. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. This is The Wright Show. You are Matt Ridley. Uh, and first of all, you're, a, you're an old friend. I should confess to that. Uh, we've known each other at least since we both wrote, about, uh, wrote books about evolutionary psychology at least 20 years ago. Books that are still being read and talked about, particularly yours. <laughs> well, I don't know. You, if you have evidence of that, I'm delighted to hear it. Uh, yours is still on my shelf. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about uh, climate change largely. Um, and you are, you know, if one Googles your name um, and climate change, I've noticed... You will you will turn up a number of people who beg to differ with you about climate change, and that's what we're going to talk about. Before we talk about that, I want to say that you've written a lot of other books too. Most recently, The Rational Optimist, and you are also a member of the House of Lords. Is that right? Yes, it is. Um, uh, two years ago, I managed to get myself elected to the House of Lords, and you might think the House of Lords is an unelected body. I might. And it- and mostly it is, but um, for long and complicated reasons, when it got reformed ten years ago, there was a there was a little sort of rat hole left in the constitution whereby those hereditary peers mm-hmm. who used to be in it, a small number of them were still allowed to sit in there, and they were self-selecting, as it were. So mm-hmm. that was how it. So forty-eight people voted to uh, to choose me from among twenty-seven candidates, which is an odd kind of election. But uh, until I'm abolished, which won't be long, I'm a full voting member of the House of Lords, along with about 800 other. You don't mean like you f- will be physically abolished. You just mean you won't be a lord if this happens. Well, who knows? Uh, <laughs> anything can Ridley. happen. Should I call you Lord Ridley? I'd much rather you didn't. Should um, I call you Lord Matt? Uh, no, I'd much rather you called me Matt. I mean, okay. uh, you know, I had a whole career being just Matt Ridley before my father died, which mm-hmm. made me technically... You know, callable as Lord Ridley, and um, now that means something with the House of Lords. But uh, uh, it, I'm not going to start changing my name just because I've, okay. uh, you know. Still, I, I, still, if at any point during this I fail to show you sufficient deference, I encourage you to reprimand me. <laughs> well, um, um, we've just uh, I've just been having a debate in the Lords just now, and and the great thing is you say things like. I'm sorry to say that the noble lord is c- talking complete nonsense. I know. I, I love the. I, I used to watch the, uh, the 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 questions for the prime minister, which is which is not the House of Commons, I guess. But same same idea, same same style of of debate, and same wonderful uh, combination of pseudo respect and contempt. Um, the uh, so anyway about this climate change thing. Yeah. Now, you have been variously identified as a climate change skeptic, a climate change denier, and other things. And we'll talk about those terms and what you yourself consider yourself. But one reason I've always wanted to talk to you about this is because, first of all, I should confess, I have not really kept up with this issue. I don't really know the territory. There is what seems like something approaching a consensus that it is this, uh, you know, climate change is largely man-made and uh and has horrible consequences down the road and we should we should do a lot about it um and because you know some people i trust are paying attention and tell me the consensus is more or less right i kind of take their word for it uh and and some of them also tell me the people who believe otherwise are cranks but i happen to know that you're not actually a crank i've, I've known you long enough so to to know that you're not crazy so i've always wanted to hear what exactly your position is and what the issues are from your point of view. And I should warn people, again, this won't be a debate. This is not you against the other side. This is just an exploratory interview from my uh, point of view. So first of all, denier versus skeptic, which, if either, are you? Now, the term I prefer is, is lukewarmer because a lot of ske- uh, proper scientists quite rightly say, look, we're all skeptics. You know, we're, we're supposed to be skeptical about science. And the word denier is just a pretty nasty one. It's, it's, it, I, I can't make out what I'm supposed to be denying. I don't deny that climate change is real. I don't deny that it's man-made, at least partly, perhaps mostly. Um, what I do deny is that there is good evidence that it's about to turn really dangerous. And uh, that, indeed, it's happening worse than expected. I mean, my main beef is that the problem has been exaggerated. 
Uh, I think it's real. I think it's happening. I think it's man-made. And I think it's not going to be that bad. And I can go into the reasons why. And by the way, just to do a little history here, I came at this from... Uh, as you rightly say, I'm not an anti-science person. In fact, I spent virtually the whole of my career carrying a lot of water for science on many issues against creationism, against genetically modified, and before genetically modified crops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, so um, uh, nature, nurture. You know, I've, I've stuck up for what I think is the scientific, rational, empirical side of of, of every argument. Um, and uh, what and and I did you know on climate change, I would describe myself as a completely conventional. Uh, follower of the conventional wisdom when I first started writing about it in the late 80s. I just went back actually a couple of weeks ago and read some of the stuff I read for The Economist in the late 80s and it's it could come word for word from the IPCC today with a few wrinkles about the way that mm. people talk about things have changed. Um, uh, and what's changed my mind? Well firstly I wrote a book called The Rational Optimist which was about how the world's getting better not worse and that forced me to confront the big pessimism of our day which is climate change which is the the argument that that our grandchildren are going to have it a lot worse, even though things are getting better for most people in the world at the moment. Um, and that made me go back and examine predictions of ecological doom from pesticides to uh, population explosions to, you know, deserts advancing, acid rain, all these things, and, and came to the conclusion that nearly all of them had been wildly exaggerated in the way they were presented at the time and they they mostly faded away and that made me more skeptical and then i began to look at the science of climate change itself and became much more skeptical because it was clear that it wasn't happening as fast as the models were predicting it was slowing down rather than speeding up the models themselves were based on a piece of physics that wasn't showing up in the real world sure. that is to say the the greenhouse effect of carbon dioxide, sure, that's fine, but that can't get you dangerous warming. You know, that can only get you a degree for a doubling of carbon okay, dioxide. Okay, so let me let me uh, get clear on that. You're saying, first of all, it's manifestly the case that consensus models from, say, 10, 15 years ago have turned out to overestimate the rate of uh, at which the planet gets warmer? Yeah, basically, um, the IPCC in its report in... And, and remind us what IPC stands for. Yeah, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the UN body that, that collates a gigantic report on climate change every six years. Mm -hmm. And its latest report in 2014 uh, admitted that uh, 111 of the 114 model runs were too hot. But, you know, we're predicting higher temperatures today than has actually happened. Okay. Um, and to put it in perspective, basically, we've been told to expect 0.2 to 0.3 degrees per decade, which works out at two to three degrees per century. You know, that's the kind of, you know, that, that and a lot of people are talking about four degrees per century, you know, but, but two to three degrees per century would give you 0.2 to 0.3 degrees per decade. That was explicitly predicted. In fact, we've had um, just over 0.1 degree, if you go back 50 years, uh, and much less than that if you go back 20 years. So, um, uh, you know, we've had all, what's often described as the pause, what the IPCC itself refers to as the, as the hiatus for the last 17 or 18 years, with virtually no net global warming at all during that period. Over, even, the, over the last 17, 18 years? Correct. I mean... How come, the, how come every headline I read seems to suggest otherwise? Well, th they say 2014 is the hottest year on record. Um, <laughs> now, that's... Uh, completely compatible with what I just said, because in one of the data sets, the NASA one, it is the hottest on, on record, but by two hundredths of a degree warmer than 2010 and maybe three hundredths of a degree warmer than 2005. You know, so by tiny margins. The margin of error in these calculations is ten hundredths of a degree. So it's within the margin of error. So there's no significant warming over that but period. But that would still be half a degree. No longer since, controversial. That would still be half a degree since 2005 if I did the math right, right? No, no, no. no, oh, no, oh, no three, tenths, three tenths since 2005. S sorry, did what? I may have got it wrong. Oh, no. Three, three hundred. Oh, okay. I may have heard it wrong. You probably got it right. Okay, so yeah. that really, uh, those rates really would be, would definitely not add up to two or three degrees per century. Um, yeah. So, but if that's true, why don't more... <laughs> people say this. And again, I want to emphasize, I don't know the territory. Uh, you know, people, people will uh, likely scream at me for not challenging you more, but 
this is your perspective we're hearing. Why uh... people do scream at me? I mean, one of the one of the things that puzzles me about this debate is just why it's got quite so vicious. I and, do I want mean, to talk about that later. I mean, po politics have gotten time. more vicious generally, at least uh, in this country. And um, but I was wondering as I was thinking about this conversation we were going to have, why it is so. Bitter. I mean, even the word denier, does it seem to you that the word denier is chosen for its most unfortunate historical resonance? Or is is that, I mean, I've only heard the term denier applied in one other context. The uh, Holocaust. Right. Yeah. And, and if you go back and look at when it starts to be used against uh, climate change skeptics, they it is people explicitly saying these people should be as disgraceful as Holocaust deniers. They say uh, that yeah, explicitly? They say that. They say that explicitly. George Monbiot says it. Uh, there's uh, somebody else says it. Uh, Eleanor, something or other. Anyway, I can, you know. But, and, but, and I will yeah. say, and, you know, it I, may may catch on for other reasons, but there is no doubt that there's an element of, uh, you know, this is trying to put you beyond the pale, trying to say, you know, you really mustn't think that. And I will say, I hear some, you know, vituperation from the other side as well. It, uh, right. Not from you personally, but, you know, to the point of thinking it's a giant conspiracy, you know, the, uh, and so on. But, yeah. but anyway, it's a bitter it, debate for whatever at reason. At least in my country, you don't get the abusive words from people who are on the public payroll on the, on the other side of the argument. In other words, there's no skeptics in public positions working for the government, working for universities who are saying these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There are a few skeptics in universities, but they're amazingly polite. Uh, now, there are there are people on blogs who are throwing four-letter words mm -hmm. at uh, climate alarmists or whatever. Uh, one, one of the things I don't know is what to call people on the other side of the argument, because they say they don't like being called alarmists, but I feel that's not as inaccurate as denial. But, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm happy to choose whatever word they want, they want to choose. Mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, it, it seems to me that that's the asymmetry is that, uh, you know, I get called a denier by the chairman of the committee on climate change in this country, by lots of academics in public universities, by government ministers on television, etc., cetera, et cetera, on, in my own party, by the way. <laughs> and yet I'm not a denier. I'm not denying that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, that we've had some man-made warming, that we're likely to get more. The only thing I'm denying is that the extreme dangers we're talking about are any longer very plausible. I think they're now highly implausible. I think we will get warming. It will continue to be mostly beneficial, which it is at the moment, by the way, and I could, we can talk about that at the yeah, moment. You know, it's happening in winter. It's, it's reducing winter death rates. It's carbon dioxide is causing plants to grow faster, etc. But, you know, actually, why does this matter? Why don't I just say, okay, people can exaggerate if they want. I don't mind. You know, it's none of my business. Um, well, the answer is because the remedies we are taking against it are very expensive and painful, and particularly for poor people. And so I think that the real problem is that the cure is worse than the disease. Okay. Uh, now, now, before we get into that, let's, let's get back to this question of if you're right um, – and actually, the rate of warming is has been quite slow in the last 10, 15 years, as you're saying, as I understand it, and wouldn't add up to two or three degrees uh, per century. And moreover, shows that the models uh, back then were wrong and should, in your view, instill some humility as we assess current models. Um, if it's that straightforward, like actually the planet's not warming up very fast, uh, why why don't... Why don't I hear that from, you know, from anyone but you? <laughs> <laughs> well, the answer is it's not just anyone but me. I mean, if you, you know, there are there are plentiful websites uh, and, you know, senior scientists, people like Dick Linzen at MIT, uh, you know, who are saying this too. But there is a degree to which the media has taken sides in this argument and does not like to, with a few exceptions, you know, Fox News over there and one or two newspapers over here, um, and do, you know, which the media does not like to uh, present this issue fairly. Now, 
I'm, I'm today involved in a debate in this country, nothing to do with climate change, where the media takes my side. And I have to say, it's, it's a very pleasant experience having, you know, um, every debate, every television debate kind of skewed your way. I mean, I was on television at lunchtime arguing with somebody and basically the interview was completely on my side. And, you know, it was very difficult for the other guy, etc. Um, and I suddenly that, what, saw what it's like. This what, is issue about is that, my, what issue is that, by the way, and what side of it are you on? Is that the electronic cigarettes thing? No, that that too. But uh, no, the, the, today it's mitochondrial replacement therapy, which is basically uh, changing embryos mm. so as to replace the mitochondria, uh, so that people won't inherit uh, horrible mitochondrial diseases. That's mm. something that this country is about to approve. It, mm. it passed the House of Commons today. It's going to come to the House of Lords shortly, and if it does, then we will start to license this procedure, which would be a first in the world. The U.S. Okay. is not yet ready to do this, as I understand it. So, um, you know, so it's an issue that gets people worked up, and it's basically me against the Catholic Church. Or, I'm sorry, not me, but it's you know, people like me against the Catholic Church, um, and. Um, uh, so it, it's given me a glimpse of just how much the media can, without coming out and saying so, be one-sided in these debates. And why do you think that is? I mean, it's certainly true that the, the New York Times headlines I remember just every once in a while say, international rep report says things are even worse than we thought, kind of. Uh, what if if as you say that's grossly well that that part is true i guess but but well maybe that's the answer i mean i mean the the official body the closest thing to kind of an official body is is saying these things right the media is not not distorting that so is is that where well, in your yes view no. the problem yes, is yes no this is the, the the ipcc reports themselves are actually not bad documents if you go and read deep in chapter three, it says on the one hand, on the other hand, and, and you know, if you go and look at its forecast, it says we could see anything from 0 0.3 degrees of warming in this century to 5.4 degrees. That's the envelope it gives. And if you go and look up the assumptions behind the 5.4, they're completely barking mad. The world population shoots up again. We all go back to using much more coal, et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of my points is that we never look at the assumptions. We only hear about the top end of the range. And actually, they have a bottom end of the range. In their summary for policymakers, which is a much more political document, which is the only thing the journalists ever read and the only thing they ever talk about, it does get much more biased and political. And there's lots of evidence for that. I mean, there's, there's some very good investigative journalism done by somebody in Canada called Donna Laframboise looking into who is getting on these committees and writing these reports. And, and there is huge infiltration by environmental NGOs. You know, the World Wildlife Fund has something like... 50 or 100 affiliated people who are IPCC authors. So um, uh, while there is good science in the actual report itself, the process is highly politicized of producing the summary. And one of my beefs is that science is full of confirmation bias, of people looking for evidence to support their preferences. I do it, you do it, sorry to say so, but I'm sure you do. Speak for um, yourself, speak for yourself, Matt. <laughs> uh, the way science is honest is not, as scientists often claim, because they challenge their own data. They say, I'm going to look for data that's going to disprove my theory. People never do that. What happens is that they challenge each other's right. things. And I think the crucial aspect of science is that it's decentralized. There's, Harvard is trying to beat up Princeton and vice versa. You know, the, 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 and, and that's what the IPCC process has, has messed up. Because it said, you've all got to come together in one room and come out with a consensus, which we can sell. So, so it becomes a body susceptible to kind of lobbying. Well, all the usual levers of political influence. I, I mean, it becomes something that interest groups are focused on influencing in your, in your view. And, and, and then in your view, the question becomes, why, uh, why is the balance of interest groups on the one side of the question? Well, and the answer to that is, is A, um, disaster sells you know we've known for 50 or 60 years that if you if you come up with a report saying no the future is not very worrying you won't get much coverage and if you come out with one saying it could get very dangerous you'll get a lot more coverage you'll get a lot more grant money you know the amount of grant money going into climate science is huge now compared with 20 years ago now that's all under threat if if they suddenly were to back up shop and say actually we've changed our minds it's not really happening so there is of course an enormous vested interest now there are vested interests on the other side too the so-called fossil fuel lobby and i personally have got an indirect interest in fossil fuels 
in coal mining on land in the north of England, where I come from, um, which no doubt influences me. Um, uh, but I own up to that always. I'm doing so at the moment, etc. Uh, and uh, it, it, you know, I, I, there is on both sides. There are people in the renewable industry, and I probably could actually make more money out of renewable energy on my land if I wanted to. But I don't like doing that because that money comes out of subsidies taken off taxpayers at the point of a gun, as it were, whereas the coal money is just market uh, forces and is not, you know, is not extracted from taxpayers or rather from electricity bill payers, because that's the way we do it in this country. Mm -hmm. Now, it is the IGCC's report. Uh, you talked about the broad range of possibility sketched in the report. But I gather the right in the middle of the belt, I mean, the kind of 50 percent probability point, that is several degrees per century, right? Well, yeah, not quite, actually, again, because in their 2014 report, they refused to give a best estimate for climate sensitivity. They'd done so in every previous report. They'd said our best estimate, you know, this is our range and this is our best estimate. Um, they didn't give a best estimate this time. Now, why was that? Because all the latest studies had been clustered at the bottom end of the range. The phrase climate sensitivity, by the way, technically is defined as the amount of warming you get from a doubling of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all the recent evidence had clustered towards the bottom end of their range. So if they were really going to give a best estimate, it would have been lower than, than last time. And they didn't want to do that for political reasons, I think. Now, I might be wrong, and they might have other reasons for doing that. But the, the, either you can say, right, the estimates have now spread out, so we can't, we just don't want to give a middle range number because it's meaningless, that it's a huge range. Or you can say, we're trying to avoid admitting that, that our best estimate of climate sensitivity has gone down. But there have been four or five peer-reviewed papers from major universities in high-profile journals over the last two years giving estimates of climate sensitivities that are really very low indeed. I mean, we're talking for the immediate effect, the transient climate response, as it's known, which is the sort of 70-year immediate effect. We're talking 1.1 to 1.6 degrees, that sort of range. Um, well, that nobody thinks that's dangerous. You know, everybody thinks danger starts at two degrees or more. Nobody thinks anything under two degrees is, is, is dangerous. And, of course, the slower it happens, the less dangerous it is because the more time we have to adapt and the more time we have to get rich and be able to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Now, do you uh, think that the, the composition of the scientists themselves, I mean, I mean, leave aside kind of lobbying at the level of the IGCC, do you think people in the business of studying climate, on balance, have an ideological bias? On, on balance, not all of them. But, uh, and if so, how did, how did that come to be? Well, I think only to the degree that uh, um, uh, Jonathan Haidt identifies that, you remember, he famously asked people in a social science audience to put their hands up how they voted, and now it's basically 90% liberal or, mm -hmm. you know, and... 5% conservative. But these, are, but these are physical scientists. I mean, I mean exactly. in social but science, it, you kind of see it because a lot of the people get into it because they want to change the world. So their models of human behavior have to be amenable to change being feasible in every possible area and so on. That's the argument, at least. But these are physical scientists. Yeah, but the, the, the liberal bias in academia is well established across all sciences. It's probably not as bad, you're right, in physical sciences as it is in, in social sciences. But actually, of course, there are quite a lot of social scientists in on the, uh, the climate change thing too. You know, I mean, everybody's piling in on the act. You know, there's lots of psychologists studying why people like me are so mad. There are uh, economists studying the effects, et cetera, et cetera. So, so uh, it's not just physical scientists who contribute to these, these reports. But, but yeah, so that, that you start with a liberal bias. But then, you know, why is worry about climate change a liberal issue anyway? I mean, it's clearly a left-right issue, particularly in the US, where the Republican Party is, is far more sceptical than the Democratic Party. Um, it's not immediately clear to me why that is. Um, after all, in a sense, what climate change is saying, or what climate change alarm is saying, is we need to pay quite a harsh price today, including particularly poor people, because we're going to do things like biofuel programs that are going to put up the price of food and cause malnutrition and kill 200,000 people a year, which is the best estimate we've got, by the way. 
We're going to do that kind of thing to poor people today, but don't worry, it'll be worth it because our great-grandchildren, who, by the way, are going to be quite rich, particularly our great-grandchildren in the West, are going to avoid a problem. Okay, now sketch so, that part out again, the dire consequence of the approach to solving the problem you're saying entails what and for what reason? Well, uh, at the moment, what we do is we divert 5% uh, of the world's grain crop into making motor fuel on the grounds that it's that it displaces fossil fuels. It actually does a terrible job of displacing fossil fuels. It actually saves about 0.6% of the world's oil use at the moment. But that has a noticeable effect on world food prices. Because, for example, 40% of the U.S. maize crop is going to make motor fuel rather than food now. Okay. So that is literally taking food out of the mouths of, of people who need it. Now, run those numbers, what effect that price increase has on malnutrition in the developing world, and you get an estimate that maybe 200,000 people a year are probably dying who wouldn't otherwise die. Now, that's a real cost. At the same time, what it does is it raises the price of food, which, which gives an economic incentive for someone to cut down an acre of rainforest, and you are getting genuine rainforest destru destruction to grow biofuels in places like Southeast Asia, where they're growing palm oil for diesel, etc., so there are all sorts of downsides of the policies we're adopting. Likewise, wind energy is at the moment extremely expensive. That cost is subsidized by governments. That subsidy is taken off the electricity bills of people, uh, certainly in most of Europe and uh, I think in the US too, that's the way it's done. The result of that is that, of course, because electricity bills are a larger part of people's budgets, of family budgets in poor families than in rich families, that it's hitting the poor harder than the rich, etc., etc. So there are all sorts of drawbacks of this policy that if, if we said, to hell with it, we're not worried about it, we're just going to go for the cheapest energy we can find, wherever we can get it, and we're, not, we're going to grow food to grow food, we're not going to grow it to make fuel, then, there would, then we would hurt the poor less. There's no question about that. You know, we're, we're, we're not subsidizing coal-fired power stations in Africa because we think it's bad for CO2. Well, that's the cheapest and best way of getting electricity to the billion people in the world who still haven't got access to electricity and whose lives are pretty miserable as a result. So, there are, you know, we are paying a cost. There's no question about it today. Now, we are told that that cost is worth it because Armageddon is coming at the end of this century. That reminds me tremendously of a lot of previous warnings, including the eugenics ones, which were all about bear the pain today because there's a much worse problem in the future. And I think we need to challenge those kind of things because it's, it's holding a theoretical future pain in the balance against a modern uh, existing pain. Okay, and your claim is not only that the, the pain does not await us, but that at the rate at which the planet is actually warming, in your view, the consequences are on balance good, right? Yes. Um, uh, the, um, the big one is the carbon dioxide fertilization effect. Carbon dioxide levels have gone up by about 30-40% since the Industrial Revolution. Um, that's almost certainly our fault. I mean, you can find people who argue that it's not, that it's some natural phenomenon. I don't myself believe any of them, um, but, uh, you know, it's not, it's not impossible. They will persuade me one day, but not at the moment. Um, those increases have demonstrably increased the growth rate of plants around the world. If you want to grow tomatoes commercially, you pump CO2 into your greenhouse to increase the growth rate of, of your tomato plants. That's mm -hmm. done in you know, the Netherlands, all these other big tomato grain places. Uh, and you can measure this carbon dioxide fertilization effect. It's, a, it's particularly powerful in dry areas because the pl plant doesn't have to open its pores quite so much to get carbon dioxide in, so it loses less water. So the result of that, if you run it through the crops of the world, how much wheat and rice and maize, the big three crops, have increased in yield as a result of the carbon dioxide fertilization effect, um, it's, it's in the trillions, the, the benefit, the trillions of dollars of benefit that we've had from that over the last 40, 50 years. If you, and, and by the way, it's cut the amount of land we need to grow enough food to feed the world, likewise, by something like 11%. It's a medium number. Again, these are wildly broad brush estimates. Of course, we can't know exactly the numbers. But the other thing it's done is that it's increased the growth rate of wild ecosystems. And back in the 80s, a guy called Ralph Keeling, who was the first person who measured the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, noticed that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was going up and down seasonally at a 
further than it did before. In other words, there was a greater amplitude of fluctuation between seasons than it used to be. And he says that must mean that more is being absorbed every year. And that must mean there must be more green vegetation in the Northern Hemisphere every summer. And we now know from satellites that over the past 30 years, there's about 14% more green vegetation on the planet than there was in the early 1980s. Um, uh, is that 30 years, yeah, 30 years. So 14% in 30 years, roughly. And that's true in all ecosystems. It's true in the Amazon rainforest. It's true in the northern taiga. It's true particularly in the semi-arid areas like the Sahel north of the Sahara Desert. Really? Um, because you, you would think that in semi you would think there might be some place where it's now getting too hot for vegetation. There is such a thing as a place that's kind of <laughs> too hot for vegetation, but that's basically not happening anywhere? Yeah, I think there's a place that's too hot. There's a place that's too dry. Right, um, okay. You know, uh, so I think, I think obviously, you know, yeah. in, in, in uh, moisture limitation kicks in. But rather like people used to say, well, coral reefs are going to die if it gets too hot. Actually, no. If you go to the, to the Persian Gulf, coral reefs survive in water that's far warmer than the Great Barrier Reef, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the temperature itself of the water is not the problem of coral reefs. It's rapid changes in the temperature that cause bleaching and death of coral reefs. Okay. And what about uh, farming? Are there more parts of the world that are, uh, you know, it, it must change. There, there are changes in, I, I assume, average heat and various other things uh, in various places that have grown accustomed to a particular climate um, and and where people make a living based on that assumption, right? I mean, wheat grows well here and it doesn't grow well here. That is changing if slowly, right? Well, um, the where wheat grows has changed dramatically in North America over the course of the last hundred years. You can grow wheat a heck of a lot further north than you used to. Mm -hmm. Now, a little bit of that will be climate because we have had warming over the last 100 years. But most of it turns out to be different varieties, to, you know, selecting varieties that are cold tolerant, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, uh, and, um, you know, that effect is overwhelming the any effects of climate you can find on, on crop. I mean, I don't know of a single example of a, of a crop that you can no longer grow in a particular country because that country's got too warm for it. Now, it might have got too dry for it. You know, you might have uh, deforested it so you don't have uh, water in the rivers that you use for irrigation or something like that. But that's, you know, the, there are huge land use changes that affect what you can grow in countries. But temperature itself is not one of them. And by the way, if you, if you look at the carbon dioxide, the greenhouse theory closely, what it says is that most of this warming will happen at night most of it will happen in winter, and most of it will happen in the in northern latitudes rather than uh, low latitudes. Mm. So, on the whole, we're warming up cold winter nights much more than we're warming up hot summer days. And you can see that in the Arctic data. You know, Arctic winters have moved, we've warmed quite significantly. Arctic summers have hardly changed at all. Uh, in fact, most of them are about where they were in the 1930s. They cooled a bit in the 40s and 50s. They warmed a bit in the 80s and 90s, that sort of thing. So... Um, uh, just back to farmland, though, Jesse Orzabel has done a fascinating calculation, Rockefeller University professor, uh, that um, we may be at or past peak farmland. And what he means by that is that the rate at which yields have been increasing as a result of genetics and chemicals and fertilizers, mainly fertilizers, that's the big thing, uh, the rate at which that's been increasing around the world uh, is now faster than the rate at which population is increasing and demand for food is increasing. And even if you throw in increasing demand for meat and increasing preparedness to waste food and to, to you know to be profligate in our use of food, you know, and, uh, a, a billion Chinese wanting to have a much better diet and all that kind of thing, he throws all that in, and he still says we're going to need less farmland in 2050 than we need today. Now, why haven't we seen that? Well, in some places we have. Most of Scotland used to be farmed. Very little of it is now. Most of it is now just left to, to wilderness. You're seeing that in most of New England used to be farmed. Very little of New England is now farmed. So in part, in, in the Western world, you are seeing a huge reforestation going on. That's a big phenomenon in northern and western countries. And indeed, in any country with a GDP above about $4,000 per capita. Bangladesh is reforesting, for example, at the moment. China is reforesting. Africa's not. Af Africa's deforesting still. But so, so you are seeing a release of land from agriculture, marginal land from agriculture. 
Why aren't you seeing more of that? Well, partly because of this biofuel thing. We're taking 5% of the world's food and turning it into motor fuel. So that's disguising the fact that we don't need as much farmland. Uh, as we used to. And that's a wonderful thing. If, if you add in the CO2 fertilization effect, you know, we are seeing the prospect of rewilding quite a lot of the planet between now and 2050. You know, increasing the size of national parks and growing forests where there weren't any, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you're saying that that is a climate changed thing that exerts a dampening effect on climate change. I mean, that is a that is a, a negative feedback situation, right? As I understand it, because because there's there's more more trees out there to to uh, to turn carbon carbon dioxide into oxygen, right? Or am I wrong? Well, uh, yes, yes, and no. I mean, certainly it's true that that you know carbon dioxide levels would be rising even faster, right? If 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 the crops weren't growing faster and the trees weren't growing faster and things like that, right? But um, that is one aspect where I am not a sceptic, as it were, in that carbon dioxide levels are increasing as fast as some of our faster predictions. So, so the one thing that hasn't underperformed is carbon dioxide level increases. You know, we're hitting 400 parts per million or 0.04 percent, as I prefer to call it, because I think it's more accurate. <laughs> um, 400 parts per million this year or round about now. That's a little bit ahead of schedule, actually. So despite all the absorption, carbon dioxide levels are rising pretty fast. Well, shouldn't that fast. alarm us? Because, I, I mean, the, so, so well, because... No, the, the, because where's the warming? That's the well, point. But, is, but, I, but we, my impression was that the... Not getting the output. But isn't there a lag between the accumulation of carbon dioxide and the warming or not? I mean, d doesn't the jury on that, doesn't the verdict come in uh, decades from now on, on that? Not really, because, uh, sure, there's a bit of a lag, but the... the you know that that was fed into the models in the in the eighties and nineties, and they said, "Blur." You know, and actually, in some ways, there's the opposite of a lag, which is that it's a logarithmic effect. Each extra increment of carbon dioxide produces less warming than the previous increment. In other words, if you add ten parts per million today at four hundred, it has less effect than when you add ten parts per million at three fifty. There's no doubt about that. That's a, you know, the curve levels up. You get diminishing returns, so you, which is why which is why you can talk about climate sensitivity as a doubling of carbon dioxide produces a certain amount of warming. Mm -hmm. Doubling from three fifty to seven hundred would produce should produce the same amount of warming as doubling from one seven five to three fifty. If you see what I mean. So are you saying that uh, there has been enough time during which uh, carbon dioxide levels have grown at an admittedly fairly high rate for us to conclude that the relationship previously posited between carbon dioxide and actual warming is, was wrong and, and that the relationship is not that strong? You're, you're saying we can already conclude that. Well, with a, with a wrinkle. The relationship between carbon dioxide and this warming is spot on. The kind of slow, moderate warming we're seeing is actually dead in line with carbon dioxide's effect alone. But all the models assume something else. And this is my beef with them. And I didn't realize this when I was writing about this 25 years ago. I, you know, I, I, it took me a long time to cotton on to this. The models assume that carbon dioxide is merely the primer. It produces only one third of the warming in itself. The other two thirds comes from extra water vapor in the atmosphere, which and is itself caused by exactly. So it's a positive feedback effect. It's an amplifying factor. And you're saying the amplification yeah. is what's wrong. That's the bit that for which the evidence is very dubious. Now, why is that? Because we are seeing some increase. The, the the data is very ambiguous on this. Some data says we are. And by the way, it's not just how much water vapor, extra water vapor you get in the atmosphere, it's where it happens. It's whether it comes to a, high, a slightly higher level in the atmosphere, whether the moist, uh, I can't remember, there's a technical term for it, whereas the, where the moist level goes higher or not, you know. But anyway, so some data says, yes, that's happening. Some data says it isn't. But whatever, water vapor has a peculiar feature, which is that it turns back to water, i.e. it forms clouds. Clouds shade the... Uh, ocean or the earth beneath them. Some clouds actually increase warming for various reasons. Most of them decrease warming. We cannot model the clouds. Nobody's worked out a way to understand what's happening with clouds. And if this warming has simply produced a slight increase in uh, it's, uh, this CO2-induced water vapor increase has produced a slight increase in cloudiness, then that would be a negative feedback. 
that would damp the warming and that would possibly explain why we haven't seen much warming in the last 15 years at all and why we've seen slower warming over the last 40 years than we expected. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, now there are other possible explanations and the favored one at the moment is that the warming has somehow got into the ocean. Um, and you'll see these charts saying the heat increase of the ocean has gone up dramatically. Not at the surface it has. not so, Sea surface warming hasn't changed much, but there is some evidence of, of a steady warming going on about 700 metres down in some oceans, not in others. And that might be that something in the ocean currents has changed so that we're getting better at transporting the heat down there. But this is measured in hundredths of a degree. And if you can really tell me you can take the Pacific Ocean's temperature 700 metres down to within hundredths of a degree using a few boys that go down 700 metres, take the temperature and bob back up again and report it to a satellite. Well, I've got a business proposition to sell you. Okay. So, in other words, I don't believe that story might be true, but I don't believe we've got any good evidence okay. that it is. So the one dire consequence, or at least one, one of the dire consequences that we haven't talked about is the effect of, of rising uh, sea levels on low land areas and, and is your argument that basically this is actually happening so slowly that that's just not going to be a very big problem basically yes um uh we've seen no significant acceleration it's gone up and down we, we, we're not very good at measuring sea level rise by the way because we because it, it you have to correct for local variation in sea level which is often you know continents are bobbing up and down all the time um and islands are um, but you know, we've got fairly good satellite data now. And that showed a kind of deceleration in recent years, then a little bit of an acceleration, then a deceleration again. Do you see what I mean? But anyway, basically, it's not changed much from a foot per century, which is the rate it's going at, three millimeters a year, roughly. Um, and uh, that rate is roughly what we had in the 20th century. You know, sea level did rise at that. It's been rising steadily for thousands of years. Nobody it's still warming up after the ice age, if you like. Mm. Um, uh, and that's mostly because of thermal expansion. Greenland's losing ice at the rate of about um, uh, uh, 200 gigatons a year, I think, which is 200 billion tons. Sounds a lot. It's about half a percent per century. Mm. Um, so, in other words, it would, you know, Greenland will just, Greenland ice cap will, will be 99.5 percent intact. Um, uh, at the end of this century, let alone, you know, so that's sort of unmeasurably small. So, so we are seeing sea level rise happen. And it is the one thing which I fully admit, if that were to speed up, then yes, we have got a big expensive problem on our hands, we would lose a lot of fertile land, we'd lose uh, lands where a lot of people live, we'd have to rebuild cities, etc, etc. Um, but at the moment, it's happening at a rate we're perfectly able to cope with. I mean, we rebuild New York fast enough, if you like, to be able to cope with a foot per century anyway, because you, I mean, hard, you, know, you just have to build a slightly higher wall for that sort of thing. I mean, the Dutch have been at it for hundreds of years. So um, uh, at the moment, there is nothing in the sea level data to suggest that there is an alarming increase. And the IPCC's predictions on sea level rise, are they give a range again, and the top of the range is a little bit worrying, but it's not, it's not 10 feet or, you know, that sort of thing that, that people would, or, or, or 20 meters, you know, or 60 meters, which, you know, people like Al Gore have talked about in the past. It's, it's, it's between, you know, uh, a foot and um, six feet or something like that that we're talking about. So I take, um, speaking of Al Gore, I assume you've seen An Inconvenient Truth. I have. <laughs> what was your view of it? <laughs> well, that it was a very slick production with some very naughty techniques to exaggerate the problem thrown in. So, what's, for example, what's the most egregious thing done in that? In that, that you, if you recall, the the one for me was where he shows the Vostok ice core, which is the the one that that records Antarctic temperatures back um, several hundred thousand years, uh, and it also records CO two levels in the atmosphere, and the two go in lockstep. So when CO2 level go, goes up, uh, um, temperature goes up, and, vice, and when it goes down, temperature goes down over hundreds of thousands of years. And he says, well, isn't that the darndest thing? Um, have you ever seen anything? You know, uh, what a coincidence, blah, blah, blah. And then he says something like, of course, the relationship between these two is complicated, but. Now, what he means by that is that when he made the film, he already knew that the carbon dioxide effect was the carbon dioxide curve 
was following the temperature curve, not preceding it. That every time the temperature went up, carbon dioxide followed it up about 800 years later. And that when uh, temperature came down, carbon dioxide stayed high for quite a long time before it came down. Now, Eve, in the world I live in, causes must precede effects. And um, if you talk to scientists about this, and I've talked to Antarctic scientists, and they say, you don't understand. What's going on is a feedback loop here. The, the Earth warms up, carbon dioxide bubbles out of the ocean, you get an increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that then warms the Earth even more. And I say, fine, show me the evidence for that, that second part of that. I completely accept that that might happen. I just want to see the evidence for it. Uh, and, you know, I said, well, in that case, why does it stop warming at a certain point and start cooling again? Well, the carbon dioxide is still going up. And they say, well, it's, you have to understand you're not a physicist, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I have read papers about this and I have come to the conclusion that I cannot find evidence for that feedback effect, let alone evidence for what Al Gore implied in that film, which was that CO2 was driving temperature over that, that, that period. Now, the, the anecdotal stuff we read about, polar ice caps melting and this, you know, creating problems for various forms of wildlife and, uh, and, and changing the economics of, ver of various things, some of that stuff is happening, I, I gather, in your view. It's just that it's, you know, consistent with the way things have been changing for centuries and, and, and not all that, and it's not all that alarming and not all that much of it is, is due to uh, carbon dioxide or what? Well, no, I, you remember I've said that I do think carbon dioxide is ca ca causing current warming. Okay. And I do think carbon dioxide can cause warming. I mean, what I just said about the ice cores doesn't mean I don't think it can. I just don't think it's the main driver for the ice ages and the ice cores. Uh -huh. um, uh, I think what we've seen in the last 50 years is uh, during the 80s and 90s, we had pretty rapid warming. Not very rapid, but, you know, it, it got it, it never got to 0.2 degrees per, per decade, which is what it's supposed to. But it was, you know, it was it was fairly fast. Now, it could be that that's all to do with changes in, in the power of the sun or cloudiness or something like that. But I don't think so. I suspect it was to do with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and with man-made carbon dioxide. I suspect most of that warming, you know, the IPCC says it's 95 percent certain that most of the warming since 1950 is man-made. I completely agree with that. By most, I mean 55%. Mm -hmm. They might mean that I'm supposed to say 80%. But do you see what I mean? You know, that's what we're talking about, the difference. Um, uh, more than half, if you like. Um, so uh, I do think that's happened. And I do think it's had effects. Uh, the Arctic ice cap, not the Greenland ice cap, but the Arctic sea ice, did retreat pretty dramatically and pretty fast and faster than was predicted up until about uh, two or three years ago. And actually it's done quite a big rebound since, which will, you know, that might mean something it might not. I suspect not. I suspect it will resume its decline. Um, uh, so that's one area where I'm prepared to concede that we have had a fairly fast mm -hmm. uh, retreat. But we've recently learned that there was almost certainly – ice-free periods in summer in the Arctic, in the current interglacial. So about seven to 5,000 years ago, with the warmest part of the current interglacial, much warmer than today, um, uh, the Arctic Ocean was almost certainly ice-free in summer. Now, polar bears would have survived. They've, they'd have gone on land, as they do in Hudson Bay today, which is always ice-free in summer, um, and then they go back on when the ice forms, etc. So they have to go through a period of living off stuff on land or, 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 or fasting. Um, uh, so I, I don't believe that even if we got to the point where the Arctic Ocean was ice-free in summer for a month or so, mm -hmm. um, you know, in September, which is its lowest extent of ice, um, I don't believe that that would cause mass extinctions of polar bears or anything else. Um, uh, and the other thing we've learned recently is that there are very fast natural climate changes. I mean, some of the stuff that's been discovered about what happens when you're coming out the ice age, I mean, about 11,000 years ago in ice in Greenland, is that you're seeing four degrees warming per decade. That's about um, 20 times what well, more than 20 times what we've seen. So 
um, there are natural warmings that can be very fast. Mm-hmm. And we don't fully understand those. As I say, I don't think that's what we're seeing. But nor do I think that the artificial warming we're seeing is faster than or at a higher level than things that have happened naturally before. Mm-hmm. Okay, so your overall argument is, uh, first of all, things aren't heating up as fast as some headlines might lead you to believe. And there's no good reason to think that they will be heating up in the future as fast as some headlines might lead you to believe. There are actually positive consequences to some of the heating that's happened uh, so far, I'm sure you'd, you'd agree there are negative consequences. I mean, there are places where a, a foot rise in sea level is a whole, whole lot, and you have to move buildings and change your way of life. But even so, you'd say that when you, you add up the costs and, and uh, benefits of the climate sh- change that it's reasonable to expect, um, extraordinary measures to prevent it are not uh, warranted given, given their cost. Yeah, and given the other priorities we've got, given the amount, the number of people without electricity, the number of people in malnutrition, the the rate of species loss caused by other things, particularly invasive species on islands, you know, these are it's a, it's all about prioritization in my view. You know, what should we be spending a fortune on at the moment? I don't think it's climate change. I think we should. I would like to spend a fortune on eradicating rats from oceanic islands on. Uh, getting electricity to people in Africa, you know, those are the things that I think are urgent uh, problems on eradicating malaria, blah, blah, blah. You know, malaria was a very good example of where the climate establishment cried wolf for a number of years, and they're no longer doing so. They've learned their lesson on that. They said uh, malaria will get rapidly worse in the 21st century because of global warming. And they forgot that actually the retreat of mosquitoes and malaria from, sorry, the retreat of malaria from North America, Eurasia, large parts of South America, etc., didn't happen because the world got less congenial to mosquitoes. It happened because we took anti-malarial measures. And that anything we do to combat malaria will have far more impact on the distribution of malaria than any change in temperature um, of the planet, making you know mosquito breeding season slightly longer, etc. That's going to be a tiny effect. And everybody now agrees with that. And so you don't find wild claims about malaria in IPCC reports anymore, but you did in the first few. So that's a nice example of something where I think they have learnt the lukewarming lesson. Okay. Okay, so I think we have the broad contours of your argument, and um, people can complain that there are challenging questions I failed to ask you, um, and uh, maybe I'll ask you them when I find out what they were. Um, but uh, uh, I've done I've done my best. Have you Have you ever had like a really good what you considered a really good productive debate with someone who really knew knew the other side of the argument? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I mean, I've had uh, email exchanges with with scientists. You know, I write a long email, he writes a long email, blah blah blah. Um, I've had uh, debates with people who who disagree with me, and and they've they've sometimes been good. But in recent years, they've got so much more bad temper, and it's so much harder to, for any you know you, you're not supposed to let me appear on a platform anymore because I've been pigeonholed as as, as an extremist in this. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, so it, it, it got a heck of a lot more fractious a few years ago. Um, it, I compare it with the nature nurture debates of the seventies, which got very bad tempered. You will remember that as well as me, you know, ice water dumped over Ed Wilson's head and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is people read their friends accounts of their enemies arguments. And that's what polarizes scientific debates. Okay. You're starting to break up a little. I think maybe there is a uh, 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 some bandwidth uh, congestion in Northern England, possibly. But we have we have been able to hear everything you've said so far, uh, and maybe we shouldn't press our luck too much longer. But um, quickly, first of all, people, uh, if they want to read about the larger worldview of yours into which this kind of fits. Uh, I think your your book, The Rational Optimist, would be uh, the most logical one to read. Um, I gather you've also, uh, you're writing another book. Uh, in fact, when I first asked you to do this, you said, well, I've got a manuscript uh, that, I, that I need to finish by January, so get back to me then. I got back to you then, and I was uh, shocked to find you. Uh, apparently, you had actually finished it, so... 
that's one difference between you and me is you meet your deadlines. If you want to say anything about that book, feel free. So authors have different philosophies about whether to talk about unpublished books. But if you, anything you want to say about that? Uh, well, I, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you the title just to tease you, uh, but maybe not go into huge, huge length. And one of the reasons I'll tell you the title is because when you hear it, you might think that I pinched it from the movies. But in fact, it was the other way around. That uh, I, I had the title before the movie came out. Uh, the title's called The Evolution of Everything. Ah. And uh, the movie's not called that. The movie's called The Theory of Everything. But, uh, you know, there you go. Um, but uh, maybe that'll help me. I don't know. Confusion. Um, and it's kind of about how unbidden trends mm -hmm. in the world, in technology, in culture, in, in morality, in, in economics are much more important than we realize and probably even more important than what people ordain to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, that we're at the mercy of sort of inexorable, inevitable forces in the world. So it's not really about evolution, although it does have several chapters on good old-fashioned Darwinian evolution too. Well, I wrote a book called The Evolution of God, so I guess the question of who has the mo more grandiose book title depends on whether you think that everything includes God or God includes everything, and that is I the have... <laughs> <laughs> If you have a view on have... that, let me know, but... Uh... <laughs> um, yours was a very good book, I remember it. Um, well, I have a chapter called The Evolution of Religion, so... That's, that's kind of what mine was actually about, but it seemed to me The Evolution of God would sell better. Actually, no, hang on. I think my chapter is called The Evolution of God. Well, and then I will the, expect to be up. mentioned in that chapter, Matt, and it's not too late to change that. that. That's a very good point. Indeed, you may have to sue me. I'd be... All publicity is good publicity, so that would be a non-zero-sum game. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for taking the time. This has been uh, illuminating to me because I didn't really understand what the issues are. Uh... And now uh, we'll put this up and, and let people complain and see where we go from there. Well, I, I hope I haven't ruined your reputation terminally, Bob. Well, there is a danger of that, but I, I had already done so much damage to it that I think the, the, you know, the marginal increase is, uh, is likely to be small. So thanks, Matt, and uh, take care.